Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kirk. Welcome to my talk. Uh, thanks for coming. So this talk um, is called Let Me Secure That For You because it has a really good acronym, I thought. Um, and how much do I want to say now? Not much. Um, what I want to just point out, and uh, this is because I did a dry run at work, and they're like, people might think this is actually what we do at Red Shield. So I just want to point out this is not what we do at Red Shield. Um, we don't use um, mod security or Node.js, although we do provide a service that provides like website shielding and uh, virtual patching um, with a whole bunch of other services around the outside of it. Um, so yeah, this talk is not an ad for what I do at work, and you shouldn't go away from this talk thinking, man, those guys run Red Shield on like a couple of uh, Docker instances, because that's not how we do it. Um, so today we're going to talk about how does virtual patching work, and can you do it DIY style? But first off, let's start talking about building an app. So you've got this great idea. Uh, I don't know, you want to revolutionize the world of to-do lists, or uh, I don't know, have a flappy uh, app flying game thing or something like that, and you're like, I need to spin up a dev team to build this, and I'm going to have a software development life cycle, and we're going to like code the heck out of this, um, and then we're going to chuck it on a web server. And you stick the app on the web server, and you're like, man, my friend said something about firewalls, so I guess I probably need to like, have a production environment and put firewalls in it, because otherwise bad guys might get in. And then, you know, like, oh, we need to take payment for it, so blimmin' PCI, so we need to install AV on all these servers that no human ever goes on anyway, and we need to have a web application firewall and a proxy for outbound egress. Um, and you're kind of like, okay, now we're secure, right? We've got all this stuff. But then, like, well, we need to have an intrusion detection system to find out if someone hacks our environment. We need to data loss protection. We need to manage identity of our people adminning these servers. Uh, we need to make sure all our servers are the same, so we need to run like an agent on all the servers, make sure they're up to date. And then we need to read those logs, so we better pump them out to a seam to be ignored. Um, and then, like, now we're secure because we've got this pipeline, like the, the stuff. We're putting code in there, and it's in a secure hosting environment. But what if the code's not actually secure to start with? So maybe we need to go back to our SDLC and do some training for the developers and, you know, have security reviews of designs and, you know, part of the BA phases of our apps, do some threat modeling. Uh, maybe run some static analysis of our code or some dynamic analysis of our code or maybe some eye analysis of our code um, and then like get security testing done, maybe part of the process, make sure that we're not introducing bugs into our environment. So you know, it's good, good quality software in, it's a hardened environment, we're reading the logs, we're secure. Our to-do app is the securest to-do app in the world. Oh, RASP, I forgot to mention that because I don't really know what it is. Um, but then you're like, well, we need to have processes to make sure that we do things properly, right? We can't just put the stuff here and walk away because, you know, the average, like, lifetime of an employee in an IT company is, I don't know, two years, and in a government department it's like three weeks. So you need to make sure that, you know, you have processes to ensure these things keep happening. So you need to like an OS hardening system, you need to manage patches going into the environment, you need to make sure that you know, files aren't changing randomly and that you know, you've got all these people using the environment but you need to make sure that you know, when they quit after two weeks you remove their access and when they change roles you need to have like an overall configuration management strategy and you need to have like cloud protection workflow agents installed on your servers. We're kind of secure now. Yeah, yeah, I think we're secure. Oh, got another one, app release automation, because, you know, we want to make sure that uh, the app that's in production uh, gets there as smoothly as possible and as close to actually what the developers intended as possible. Or maybe we need to monitor some stuff because, you know, the seam is, like, outputting logs, but, you know, we need to, like, feed stuff into it, make sure things are up, and then we need something to monitor the seam in case the seam goes down. 
Um, we need policies just to keep John happy, and we need standard operating procedures. That was a little ridgehill joke. Um, standard operating procedures, and you know, now we're secure. And you go to talk to the board of your Todoist application, and you're like, we've got the biggest, most secure application ever. And they're like, prove it. So you run some vulnerability scans. You have someone come in and do a third-party configuration review. You pay like squillions of dollars for OR information security to do penetration testing. <laughs> uh, and they like just walk in with a swipe card. No, just kidding. <laughs> that was a callback to a previous talk. Um, and, oh, and then plus you actually have real attacks. And now your management can be like confident. We're totally secure. Um, you're doing all these things. And you know, you're following industry best practices, your app is secure. I mean, it's only a to-do list app, but you're doing everything right now. Uh, so we're building our app securely, we're hosting it securely, and we're verifying that it's secure. Now, this is a pretty cheap process, <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully you're all doing it. Um, and if not, I'm pretty sure there's some vendors who are probably present, um, or at least in the market, that can help you out with that. So we've built a secure web app. So this is the end of the talk. Thanks for coming. Uh, no, not quite. What if there's bugs in our app? So the normal process is, yeah, um, well, the normal process is you don't know, but pretending you do know there's a bug um, and it's a security issue, you like ring the red bell and um, gather everyone around and say, you know, we need, to, um, we need to fix this. If you're lucky, your WAF might block some simple attacks uh, like SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Um, but, but, you know, there might be more complicated bugs that the developers need to recompile and deploy a new version or if you're like a dynamic language, they need to write new code and cross their fingers, you know, like that sort of thing. Um, and so you really need a really fast release process so that the developers can make the change in yellow, deploy it, and you're sweet. Uh, but yeah, this is really expensive. So I've worked in companies that have, you know, priorities and objectives and annual plans and stuff like that, and none of it said drop everything and fix security issues in our app. Um, and you know, you've got a, the overhead of branching and merging, which developers will tell you is like the worst thing that could possibly happen. Um, and you've got, you know, like change review board, probably, depending on where you work. Ugh. Um, you've got to actually release the software, which means someone has to wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and you know, this takes time and can take a while from when the problem's discovered to when you release it. And the clock's ticking, like, if it's an externally reported vulnerability, you know, there's a blog post waiting or a tweet uh, ready for you to fix it, and you know, they're going to talk about how it takes you ages to do it, and all you gave them was a lousy Yahoo t-shirt, um, <laughs> which is probably a collector's item right now anyway. Cause, um, and uh, like, often you don't even have the source code. Like it's, you know, it's SharePoint that's got a security issue, or it's you know, like John's financial system. Sorry, John, not you, different John. Uh, John's financial system that you know, was written in 1998, and you know, the source code was in you know, Visual Source Safe, and you know, that was on Bob's laptop, and Bob left ages ago. And you, know, you can't even fix this yourself. And even if you do need to, to do this, like, how are you going to release quickly? You're going to circumvent all your regular processes so that you can get a change out? In which case, like, what was the point in the regular processes? And, you know, blah, 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 DevOps. Um, or, you know, like, it just sucks. So what I was interested in, um, in previous, I guess, when I was kind of responsible for getting security issues fixed through the pipeline, is how can we patch the issues without touching the underlying website? So you ring the alarm bell and you say, dev team, your stuff needs to be fixed, it's urgent. While they're doing that, can we fix it in the security team? Can we patch these issues um, without waiting, like as fast as possible? Um, and so what we're doing here, um, and this is kind of the foundation for Red Shield as well, but this is not an advertisement, because this is actually a thing. It's called virtual patching. Um, and what we're doing is replacing the WAF with a more capable layer. And, uh, I've called this let me secure that for you because like, you know, we're securing it for other people um, and 
the acronym was good, which is mainly the reason why I chose that. So um, here's a table with some kind of vulnerabilities that you might need to fix. Um, and you know, some of them you can do just with a regular proxy. So you know, uh, like we had an application where there was a particular URL that was kind of insecure, um, had an issue in it, but hardly anyone used it, so we just blocked that on the proxy. Um, but some things you need a WAF for, like detecting SQL injection attacks or cross-site scripting attacks. Um, you, you know that's kind of specialised that WAFs can do. But WAFs can't do everything. Like um, they can replace HTML, but it's normally pretty janky. Um, uh, maybe they can't like modify the request due to performance reasons. You don't have state, so you can't fix business logic issues, um, and they don't understand your users and their roles. Um, in the way that you might need to do. Um, so I guess what I'm advocating is another layer, which is the code layer, which is, it's not the developer's code, it's the, the security team's code, or whoever you are's code, um, that you stick in front of your app, uh, where you can do those things that the other layers can't do. Um, so the OWASP definition of virtual patching is uh, preventing the exploitation of a known vulnerability, um, and it's actually, it's not anything new. Um, firewall vendors have been talking about this for ages for sort of OS and network level attacks and things like that. Um, it's basically just you know, having signatures and blocking attacks. Um, I would say it's an agile security approach because um, if you put agile, people will like believe you. Um, but <laughs> what I actually mean is that it's a fast approach um, and that you don't have to recompile applications and deploy them and stuff like that. Um, and you know you can react quickly. So this is our approach for doing virtual patching. So the first thing you need to do is uh, understand how to actually exploit the vulnerability, because if you can't exploit it, then you can't fix it, and you can't prove you fixed it. Um, then only patch things that are actually known. Uh, don't just like, oh man, our app's probably insecure. Let's just turn everything on and patch everything. Um, because you're probably going to break stuff, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and avoid, oh, actually, I'll talk about it like right now. Um, avoid overpatching or doing things that will cause issues. Um, so, the reason a lot of people, I should have said, how many people hate WAFs? Would that be fun? How many people hate WAFs? Oh man, all you liars. You've never used a WAF. Um, a lot of people hate WAFs because when you try and turn the security on, um, the application turns off. Um, and it's kind of like this, it's like there's a continuum, um, and, and people find it really hard to find that sweet spot where um, the application is protected. So we're going to focus only on the individual thing that we know is broken. So this works really well, like if you've got a pen test that says you've got seven things wrong, or you've got a, um, like a vulnerability report come through HackerOne or whatever that says you know, this specific thing is wrong because you can fix exactly that thing and not be worried about breaking the rest of your site. Um, yeah, through the use of if statements. <laughs> cool, just a little, um, yeah. Forgot to ask who was a developer. Um, so there's a bunch of different things you can do to fix security issues. You could just block the user like we did with that URL. Um, you can redirect them to an error page. You could transform the request or response to make it safe. So maybe if there's some input your application can't handle, you could strip those characters out. Or maybe there's something the app's displaying you don't want people to see, strip them out. Um, you could do validation, like insert error messages to say your password's too weak, or um, you know, like insert that into the stream of HTML. Um, and then of course you need to alert so you actually know you're under attack because you know you just paid $4.2 million for a scene, so you need to use it. Uh, so here's the, uh, here's the architecture. So I guess you could say this isn't, uh, this isn't like a software project that I'm presenting. It's more like assembling a couple of different components with some config files. Um, and uh, there's a web page you can go to, which is uh, uh, let me secure that for you, lmstfu.com, um, where you can like GitHub these things. And um, I wrote documentation. And it's like, this is the first time I've actually actually released source code when I said I was going to release source code. Um, and the trick is, there's not actually that much source code. Um, but it's mostly documentation. Cool. Um, so what we do is we stick a WAF mod security uh, in front of a Node app that's custom. Um, and 
and have that sitting in front of our web server. So uh, like seven people in the audience just fro uh, freaked out and uh, went, oh my God, he used the word WAF. Um, and here's some legitimate quotes that I made up from real people um, with their issues that they have with WAFs. Um, and, and it's kind of true, like everyone finds it uh, really stressful. Um, but just to recap, uh, to go back all the way back to the slide three slides ago, we're only patching known vulnerabilities. We're not just putting a WAF in front of our app and turning it on, so don't freak out. Um, so first, let's demo a vulnerable website. So here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so uh, this application is running on localhost due to a weird browser quirk that I discovered right before my laptop ran out of battery last night um, and then couldn't sleep very well because I thought my demo wasn't going to work today. Um, and then when I came back into the office and charged my laptop, um, it was just a browser quirk. Anyway, uh, enough about my sleep patterns. Um, so uh, this is a site called Zero Days. It has a logo that a guy called Jeff made for us, um, which is pretty cool. He can use fonts and stuff. Um, and basically on this site, you can go and buy Zero Days. Um, let's just ignore the fact that, yeah, anyway, let's pretend this is a real thing. So it's a daily deal site for Zero Days. Um, and basically, um, what you can do is you can like register and log in. Um, you probably need to turn Docker on. Uh, that's like a really good time to do that. Um, I thought I'd turn it all off so like everything's clean and back to pristine. Um, so you can register an account on the site. Um, people can go and look at products and make comments on them. Um, password test. Cool, good password. Um, so this is on localhost, so yeah, just browse to this if you want to look at my site. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I registered, I'm logged in, I can add products, you know, I can buy 10 of them, I can go ship them somewhere, and here's some auto-completes I completed automatically. Um, cool, give me a call anytime you want. Um, hey, hey. Hey, automatic credit card filling is disabled. Oh my god. <laughs> That's a real uh, 21. Okay, you know, and then it authorizes your credit card, and then it says, you know, here's your order, and you place an order. So uh, this is called internet shopping. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so behind, and then you can go look at your order and you know, you can search for things like you could search for all the vulnerabilities that are for sale for ghost script um, and you could like put a comment on like uh, this is old or something like that and you know, uh, social can happen. Cool, uh, so that was the app. Um, technically how it's built doesn't really matter, I'm not going to open up the code but but just because I like to brag that I can still write code. Um, it's a .NET Core app. Uh, well, it's four, three apps running in Docker on Linux um, with, um, what is it called? SQLite as a database. Cool, so yeah, enterprise grade, yeah. Cool, um, so, so that's our app. So, um, so we've released this app and you know it's great and uh, somewhere in the C-suite, they said, prove that it's great. Um, and so then they gave like three times more than we get paid to security consultants who send us this. Um, quality is our number one dream. And you're like, oh shit, look at this table of contents. This is not good. Um, and it turns out that um, this app has some vulnerabilities in it. Um, hands up if you've ever had one of these reports land across your desk. Man, opposite guys, don't put your hands up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so we've got some vulnerabilities, so let's look at some of them. Um, so I'm not sharing the source for this app uh, because I did it on company time, um, but uh, you know, hopefully these things ring a bell. Um, so vulnerability number one, turns out there's an admin section to the site. Um, where you can go and look at you know, everyone's shopping carts and uh, edit products and stuff like that. Um, and so ideally, that wouldn't be exposed to random people from test.com. 
Um, another nice little vulnerability, um, which is kind of like a real world one, is that you can like buy negative quantities of stuff. So how many do I need? Nine? Oh yeah, that's heaps cheaper. Cool. Um, <laughs> What else? Oh, oh yeah, um, there's a shopping cart thing that you go through. Um, I'll just clear it because uh, that makes the demo work. Um, why didn't that clear? Man, buggy code. Um, there's a shopping cart you can go through and you know how like we just did it that you could type some stuff in to pay. Wow, this was way faster in my head. Um, uh, payment detail screen where it's authorizing your credit card. Uh, you can't see the URL because the resolution, but that's slash step three. Let's just skip that step. Oh, yeah. Um, payment by credit card empty. Okay, place order. Cool, that order is now shipped. Um, <laughs> what else? Oh, yeah. Um, anytime you see a search box, what do you do? Single quote. <laughs> Um, oh, there's an error. What a surprise. It's almost like it's contrived. Um, so, uh, you know, if I search for ghost, I see one item, but I can union with random other tables in the database. Um, this is called SQL injection. Um, and it doesn't work. But uh, when it works, you can get stuff from other tables in the database. Oh, yeah, I forgot a quote. Thanks. Um, thank you to the professionals in the audience. Um, <laughs> it's like, it's cool, don't you love it that you just paid to attend a talk by an amateur? Although, I think, was it $70 for the conference? 50, and there's like 40 talk. Oh, this is a dollar, you paid a dollar to be here. <laughs> uh, cool, so don't complain. Um, what else? Cross site scripting, um, you've probably seen. Uh, this little baby before. Um, it's really common in every application somewhere around. Um, and so, you know, I guess I can't explain what cross-site scripting does, but it's normally a bad sign. Um, and when I'm looking at my orders, um, I notice, hey, there's a number on the URL. What if I change that number? Oh, I see Joe Bloggs' order. Cool. Okay, so our web app is screwed. Um, and this has nothing to do with all those fancy things we put in our environment, eh? Like, the seam's not going to fix this. Um, the WAF might fix some of it, um, but, like, some of these are business logic issues, you know, like, who can see whose order, or um, do you really need to go to the credit card screen before you go to the place order screen? Uh, so how are we going to fix these? Let's go back to slides, because they'll tell me what to say next. Um, yeah, so we saw all those things. I think I might have missed out a couple of them, but uh, needless to say, the website is hosed. Um, so the first layer we're going to stick in is mod security. Um, so contrary to popular belief, uh, mod security is not a dead project. Um, it's just a dying then resurrected project. Um, so mod security is a uh, open source web application firewall that you can install in your web server. Um, what really makes it good is the OWASP core rule set. Um, so, hey, look, there's a picture. Um, the bit that I like about this picture is that I'm running like three different versions of Linux in a VM thing on my MacBook in order to like serve 50 lines of code. It's crazy. Um, so, oh yeah, Docker. So um, that's Docker. Um, so mod security um, is it's originally built for um, Apache, um, and they've re sort of released a bridge to get it working in IIS and uh, Nginx, but it didn't really work that well in those web servers. So um, they're re re rewriting it in version 3, um, and it's going to be much better. Um, but unfortunately, not all the features are supported in the version 3 yet because they haven't finished it. Um, the nice thing about mod security is it doesn't really do much out of the box. You can just like enable the module, nothing changes on your web server uh, until you like configure it. The bad bit is you have to configure it. Um, uh, the reason I went over and got this book is because there's a modern book with examples that are actually correct, um, unlike most of the stuff on the internet. Um, about mod security, which applies to old versions. Um, so I've got some links 
to stuff that I think is relevant. Um, and that's actually quite a good book. Um, cool, so how you configure mod security is uh, you go to this 1176 line file that you get in the default install and you start uncommenting lines um, until it works. Um, <laughs> And uh, the mod security core rule set is this project, um, it's kind of an OWASP project, I'm not sure what its history is, um, how it got to be part of OWASP, but it's um, a bunch of rules for common web security issues, and the idea is that these rules are tuned to avoid false positives, so your app almost, shouldn't, almost always shouldn't break by turning these rules on in the kind of default setting. Um, like they, they block like really blatantly bad stuff um, as sort of a baseline. Um, and how the core rule set set up is there's basically a whole bunch of conf configuration files um, and they're grouped into different types of attacks um, and they look at the requests, they look at the responses coming back from your web server um, and then they evaluate, you know, after looking at all of that, was this really an attack? Uh, I'll just quickly show you how mod security works. If you're thinking of using mod security um, to do virtual patching, it's probably best if you cover your eyes and block your ears, or you might change your mind. Um, <laughs> no, uh, it's not that bad once you get the hang of it. But um, the thing that's quirky about mod security is that it uses Apache's configuration syntax, which is basically uh, like uh, action variable variable kind of thing. So it's quite fugly. Um, so, uh, so you have a security rule. Um, the first parameter is the thing that you want uh, to test. So here we're testing the file name of the request coming through the proxy. And you can test those other things as well, cookies, whatever. Um, then you have an expression that you're testing it against that you call an operator. So this is a regular expression test against that string with slash in it um, to see if the file name matches that path. Um, then you have the third parameter, um, which is going to span over several lines because it's just where everything else gets chucked in, mod security. Um, and you put things like um, the ID, um, so each rule has a different ID that shows up in your logs, um, what phase of request processing, um, what action to take, so to deny the request, to block it, to pass it, um, that sort of thing. Um, any transformations you want to do on the input, which I'm going to skip over, and then a message to put in your logs. Um, and mod security supports anding rules, so uh, using the chain keyword. So you can say, you know, if they're on this page and this parameter has SQL injection in it, then do this. If they're on that page and that parameter has Fred in it, do that. Um, and you can also do ORs using this uh, really ugly um, programming kind of style where you, you put markers in your code and then kind of go to statements to jump to them. But yeah, like I said, if you're thinking of using mod security, try and look past that and think of the price. Cool. So, uh, so just to demo mod security. So, um, so what I'm doing in this demo is um, the exact same web application running in the same Docker container, um, but with mod security in front of it. And the way you can tell the difference is the original app has a logo with fonts, and the new app has a logo without fonts, because um, I don't know how to do the art. Um, so uh, that's basically, um, as the request goes through, I'm just rewriting the logo to make it obvious we're on the site. Cool, so uh, the first vulnerability, which one should we do? Yeah, simple one, so accessing admin users. Um, basically, we just want to block requests um, with a certain URL. Um, so the way that um, I've split up my mod security configuration um, is for every vulnerability, I've made a separate file uh, with the number of the vulnerability, and then you know that gets tracked in source control, um, and or rolled out, or you know however cowboy thing you do. Um, and so all the issues like um, are sort of fixed in individual files. Um, so I think issue nine was the admin URL thing, and basically what we're doing in here is. Um, is check if the URL begins with slash admin, and then if the user um, if the user is logged in 
and they're not admin at redshield.co, oops, advertisement, sorry, um, then uh, if they're not the admin user, then you block access to that URL. So going back to our app, um, I log back in as that test user. Does anyone remember the password? No, lucky I do. Um, yeah, so now if I go to slash admin forbidden. Okay, cool. So, I mean, you know, you could just copy paste something like that. It's pretty easy. Um, in your logs, um, you end up with, you know, like an access denied error, and somewhere in there is the error message that I put. And if you had a seam, you'd probably pluck bits out of that log file and have a dashboard, and then no one would look at it. Cool. Um, so similarly with negative quantities, um, so we block that issue. Um, so now if I go update quantities, it's forbidding, and that's basically just a regular expression. Um, wrong editor. So um, it's saying, look at all the incoming request parameters, um, if, and uh, with a wildcard in the middle, and if any of them don't match the regular expression of all digits, uh, then raise an error. So how many more should I demo of these? Uh, Cross-site scripting. Oh, here, I'll show you this because this one's hideous. Um, so uh, we don't want people to enter XSS. Oh, damn it, they already have. Uh, let's go to a different product. Uh, we don't want people to enter XSS, so we want to block it when they do. Um, just excuse me while I do my elite hackering. Um, so uh, what we want to do is like have kind of a set of strings or common cross-site scripting that we want to block. Um, and so block that. Um, unfortunately, the core rule set, which is this OWASP project that has a whole lot of XSS and SQL injection signatures, um, doesn't have a nice way of just blocking XSS on one part of your site. Uh, so you have to do this and this. See, I told you it was hideous. Didn't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, and I've written that up on um, lmstfu.com, um, so you can have a look. Um, Cool, and the same with SQL injection, so um, that gets blocked. So I mean, you could do it a little bit more gracefully than just forbidden, um, but you know, basically the idea is mod security lets you do this. So let's find the slides. Um, here's some slides that kind of show what we're doing. So we've decided that we need to check the URL and then reject it if it's wrong. Um, we've decided for validating a parameter, we need to test if it's a positive number, so we use a regular expression. Um, if there's XSS in the input, we're rejecting the input. Um, so this is, if you want to test for XSS, this is one way to do it. Um, and this is why I advocate using a WAF to check for XSS rather than building it yourself, because uh, the people that came up with this, don't actually know what it does. Um, and, uh, and it's hard to block XSS. Um, so these are the 26 regular expressions in that core rule set project. Um, and the reason they don't know what it does is because um, they used a pool regular expression compiler to compile regular expressions into new regular expressions. And so then they put the regular expression of the regular expression into the regular expression. Um, and then, but yeah, I mean, that's what they did. Um, but it's actually been formally proven that for any regular expression, you can evade it um, with input. Um, and so, uh, damn, I should have remembered his name. Hanson, Patterson, nope, didn't put it on there. The lib injection project has been done by someone very smart, um, which is instead of using regular expressions, um, it tokenizes the input to block, uh, to figure out if something looks like JavaScript and then block it. Um, they do the same with SQL injection. You can block cross-site request forgery using mod security, but it's, it's kind of horrible because you have to create cookies and then encrypt them, then compare them. Um, but you know it, it's possible, and I've got a sample that I've uploaded. Um, you can add headers if they're missing. This is normally like vulnerability number one in your pen test report. You forgot to set your cookie to secure. Um, so why do we use mod security? Well, because the core rule set gives us like a low false positive uh, set of rules. Um, mod security is reasonably efficient. Um, it lets you do simple things relatively easy. We're relatively is about that thick. 
Um, and it can be extended to do complicated things, but it gets complicated really quickly. Um, the limitations are it doesn't understand your application, so it can't fix those things where you need to know about the user and what they're trying to do. Um, it's not very good at like changing content of pages. Um, the daunting syntax is extendable by Lua, but no one knows how to do that. Um, and if they do, they haven't posted on the internet. Um, so business logic, this is the, the interesting bit. This is where you write code, because you need to fix issues. But how do you keep track of like what users are doing and what their state is and stuff like that? Um, your web app does it by putting stuff in the URL or using cookies or storing stuff on disk or in a database to keep track of which user is an admin at the moment and you know what orders are they allowed to see. Um, so we need to invent our own state storage to sit in front. Um, and so that's where I just chucked Redis in because it's a really easy um, in-memory cache um, to like store data. So this, this next layer is a node proxy. Um, so node has libraries. You might have heard about them. Um, there's lots of them. Uh, this only uses 160 libraries from node. Um, but the reason it's such a small number is because it doesn't do a lot. Um, so basically, I'm using Redbird, which wraps the HTTP proxy, and then Harman, which uh, lets you manipulate HTML. Um, so this is how a proxy works. Um, probably should have done this earlier. Oh, well. Um, you probably know anyway. Um, instead of your browser talking directly to the web server, um, it, it connects to a proxy. The proxy like copies the request and then sends it on to the real web server, gets the response back, copies it, and sends it back to the user. Um, what we want to do is like intercept these, um, the request and the response and do our own custom logic in there. Um, so we've got an on request handler and an on response handler. So before sending the request to the web server, we run it through a handler. It can change stuff. Uh, then we forward it on to the server. And when we get the response back, we run it through our handler. It can change stuff. And then we send the response back to the user. So in this way, we can pretty much do anything that the real web app could do. We could write our entire application this way if we were insane. Um, so did I show more complicated vulnerabilities? Yeah, I did. I showed how you could see other people's orders. Um, so what we need to do here is keep track of which orders people have. And so in order to do this, I'm going to use a hacker tool called Telnet. No, I'm not, because it's not there. Um, does anyone know the default port for Redis? OK, you guys not helping here. Um, it's like Docker something, Docker, Docker, Docker. Why doesn't Docker do this for me? Uh, which is better, Docker or Redis? Someone tell me. Um, OK, no. Somewhere in here, it's going to say the port. OK, I'm not going to show you the port. Uh, but basically, what I was going to show you was Redis. Hey, Redis, you put data in and you take it out. Um, OK, um, so let's look at our app. So what we want to do is when the user looks at their order screen, um, the web server is sending back a, a chunk of HTML with the orders that user is allowed to see. They're allowed to see order six, a, a, order seven, and order eight. And so we store that in Redis. Um, and then when the user tries to view an order, we check in Redis and see, are they allowed to view that? I mean, that's kind of what your app would do, except we're doing it in the proxy layer. Um, oh, yeah, it should be in my Docker Compose. OK, cool. Uh, thanks, Kim. Um, my kingdom for a port. Cool. Uh, so uh, I don't know how you're supposed to use Redis, but this is how I use it. Um, so, um, so when I go to that uh, view all orders page, um, you can see that it's sending um, to Redis like this user is allowed to see um, order seven and eight. Um, and then when I actually go to an order, um, it's looking that back up again and checking that, that I'm allowed to see it. And now if I change the order number to six, um, it's blocking me. Um, and there's a little like security violation thing in the URL. But you know, you'd make that nice. Um, how does that actually look in code? 
Um, I don't know how many of you are developers, but hey, I'm going to show you anyway. Um, so uh, JavaScript, I don't really understand it. This is probably not idiomatic. Everything's asynchronous, and you have handlers and handlers and like functions all the way to the bottom. Um, but pretty much uh, what I'm doing is um, on their response to the order page, when it's displaying a list of orders, I go through the HTML um, by using a, a selector thingy. Um, and look at the URLs and grab the IDs out, and then uh, shove them in Redis. And that Redis code, I don't know how to do it properly, but it's got like all these functions, and you just chuck stuff in Redis. Um, and then when someone comes back to look at an order, um, we check if the allowed order ID matches the one that they are supposed to be allowed to see. Uh, yeah. Um, skipping the payment step, I'll, I'll skip through how this works, but you can look it up. Um, pretty much we do the same thing. So we're like, which steps of the payment process has the user been to? Um, don't let them go to step four till they've finished step three. Hey, wow, good animation on an arrow there. Ooh. OK, cool, didn't see that. Um, and we can do other things as well that are hard to do in, um, in mod security and WAFs. Like we can just use a CSS style selector across the HTML stream. Um, and as the HTML uh, pipes through Node, um, we can run a function on it and you know, turn off the autocomplete flag of HTML or uh, PCI compliance. Um, uh, here I'm getting the credit card number, uh, div tag, and replacing the value with a bunch of asterisks, uh, asterisks stars. Um, and you can do other kind of business logic things like um, you know, check how strong people's passwords are. Like the app might allow weak passwords, but you know, your your code could check against have I been pwned for the email address and uh, z z z something in .js to check if the password's strong enough. That was Jen's talk. Um, you know, uh, encrypt values that are in hidden fields that are that shouldn't be in plain text, or put tamper protection to stop people modifying stuff. I mean, basically, the world is your oyster because you're writing code now, right? Anything you can write in code, you can write in your proxy layer. Um, why should you use Node? Because JavaScript is the language of the internet, TM. Um, I haven't tested whether it's fast scale or scalable, but people use this Node proxy library to front their Node apps, um, so it must be pretty fast. Um, and because it's manipulating HTML in a streaming fashion, um, you don't have to like buffer up the response, edit the HTML as a giant string, and then send the response through. Um, bad things, oh, programming is so hard. Um, but I mean, this is this I guess is a proof of concept example of how you could do it. Um, but you could wrap this stuff up into libraries to make it easier. Um, so you could be basically saying, you know, replace this with this, store this with that, and not have to write the Redis code every time, et cetera. Um, we still need mod security because I don't want to write regular expressions in JavaScript to test for SQL injection. Um, and so, like, which tool is the right one for this um, is, a dis is like a question. So some of the vulnerabilities I was fixing did in both tools and then picked the nicest uh, virtual patch out of the two. Um, so virtual patching is a thing. Uh, people now know about it in this room. Um, you can fix applications without having access to the source code or without waiting for a release. Um, and you can do basic things like blocking URLs, or you can do more complex things like basically writing application logic in a different layer. Uh, this gives you another tool to add to your tool belt. Um, and you know, as security professionals, the more tools we have, the better, um, or something. Um, and uh, if you prepare this infrastructure in advance, you can be ready to respond to an attack. So putting mod security in front of your application is as simple as changing your Apache config if you're using Apache already. Um, and it's not going to add any performance impact until you start turning stuff on. Um, so you know it's really easy to be ready to have that module installed uh, so that you can use it. Um, or you could have this as a separate layer in front of your app. Um, that cool diagram of the animation that took me way too long. Um, I was procrastinating content by doing animation. Um, now we can react quickly. And that's what all those things didn't give us the ability to do. Um, so 
you know, that's kind of, I guess, the takeaway. Um, just to recap, we're only patching like actual vulnerabilities. We're not just turning mod security on for a whole site. Um, we're not doing anything crazy, so there should be very low risk. Um, ooh, this talk is not an advertisement. Advertisement. Um, and before I finish, I have one second left. I would like to tell you about OWASP Day New Zealand. So Kim, myself, and a couple of other people who might be here um, organized this free conference. Um, the next one is in February. It's in Auckland. Um, did I say it was free? Um, and it's a web security conference. And it would be really great for you all to come. Uh, did I mention it was free? Um, but uh, I guess $50 isn't a barrier anyway, so we should just charge 50 bucks, but then we have to do paperwork. Um, so yeah, it's free. Um, we're really looking for people to speak, share their stories. Now, because this conference is about web developers learning about security, um, as well as security professionals honing their skills, we have two streams. So if you're a developer and you have a story to share about how you've done security in your organization, things you've learned, how you do your JavaScript or .NET or Java or, or Ruby or whatever. We'd love to have talks like that submitted. Or if you're a security pro and you want to like talk about hardcore hacking stuff, you know, we have a room for you as well. Cool. Yeah, that, that was supposed to be positive. Um, the other thing I would like to point out is that if you're a Wellingtonian, there's an OWASP chapter. If you're a Christchurchonian, there's a, there's a OWAS chapter, and if you're an Aucklander, there's a chapter that doesn't have any meetings, but will soon. We say that, hopefully. Um, but there's also other meetups that go on in Wellington, so if you've got interested in this security thing from this conference, um, I bought a URL because the meetup URL was too long to put on my slide, so just go to securitymeetups.com and it'll list the Wellington meetups that you can go to. Um, some of them are closed, most of them are open access, and they have different focuses. So go there and have a look. Cool. Uh, sorry for going uh, three minutes over time. Oh no, one minute and 53. <laughs> How do you use clocks? Um, thank you very much for attending this session. I hope you had a great conference. Thank you. Thank you.